Queen Elizabeth passed away Thursday at the age of 96 and in a 70-year reign as a monarch. She was the world's longest serving monarch. It's sad time, but one that the crown has been preparing for since the 1960s. The plan for what to do after Elizabeth's death is called Operation London Bridge. And the steps that will be taken now that the Queen has died are strictly controlled. UK is now preparing for a new era. After Queen's death, King Charles III will return to London and address the nation on Friday afternoon. The country now enters a mourning period that continues until after her funeral. This is all 24 News special coverage. Queen Elizabeth II died Thursday at her Balmoral residence at the age of 96 after a reign of 70 years after coming to the throne in 1952. Queen Elizabeth led the longest reign in British history, marked by her strong sense of duty and her determination to dedicate her life to the throne and her people. The royal family issued a statement on behalf of the new king who will be officially called King Charles III. The death of my beloved mother, Her Majesty the Queen, is a moment of the greatest sadness for me and all members of my family. We mourn profoundly the passing of a cherished sovereign and a much-loved mother. I know her loss will be deeply felt throughout the country, the realms and the Commonwealth, and by countless people around the world, during this period of mourning and change, my family and I will be comforted and sustained by our knowledge of the respect and deep affection in which the Queen was so widely held. All right, now let's bring in our guests. We have uh, Stephen Hall, a lecturer, assistant professor in politics and international relations at Russia uh, University of uh, Bath from England, along with uh, Yvonne Ridley, a journalist and political analyst from UK, as well as Donald Lowry, a senior fellow in History University of Oxford from UK. Madam, gentlemen, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and uh, our sincere condolences for the passing of Her Majesty. 
Let me start with you, uh, Mrs. Ivan, since you have been a former correspondent at uh, the Royal uh, Palace. How was the news of her passing accepted, let's say, in England and to you, to your person? Well, although she was 96, um, her death when it came was completely unexpected. Just 48 hours earlier, we'd seen pictures of her um, accepting the new British Prime Minister, Liz Truss, and the Queen looked in remarkable health. She was uh, beaming and, and uh, she looked in a very happy state. So mm -hmm. 48 hours on to discover that she had died came as a great shock to many people. Mm. Even the um, elements of Britain that uh, are not that uh, pro-monarchy were shocked because this is a, a woman who has been in our homes uh, through the medium of television. She's been very much part of our lives uh, for most of our lifetimes. I mean, I she was queen when I was born. And many of us have never known um, anyone else as, as a monarch. So it has come as a shock. And because she ruled with um, a grace and dignity rarely seen in other rulers, she didn't appear to have an enemy uh, or anyone who would celebrate her passing even those who might be deemed as um, being Republican or anti-Elizabethan uh, certainly didn't show it. Uh, the Russian ruler, Vladimir Putin, uh, sent his condolences. Uh, the leader of the Irish party, Sinn Féin, um, expressed very respectful, kind words this was a, a woman who, as I say, seemed to have no enemies and could reach out to a diverse group um, of people. And so it's not surprising that her passing has been um, mm -hmm. really felt and impacted on by ordinary people in Britain today. Mm -hmm. Very nice indeed. And uh, Mr. Donald uh, Rowley, how about yourself? How did you find the news and how can you portray, I mean, the images of the gathering uh, of the people who came by masses and by great numbers to pay tribute? Well, uh, I should uh, mention that I'm Irish by background. So I grew up in a republic um, mm -hmm. with, which has had an uneasy relationship at times with Britain. But I've, I've been able... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it seems that uh, we're having a technical... Itself. And yes, uh, you're back. I think okay. people feel it personally as though they'd lost their own grandmother. This is a very widespread feeling. Mm -hmm. It seems that uh, Mr. Donnell is having problems with his internet connection. We are going to try to get back to you, Mr. Donnell. And uh, here, perhaps, uh, my uh, co-host, uh, uh, Melissa Khimilat Noor, with me here in the studio, perhaps can ask uh, more questions to our uh, guest. Yes, uh, Yes, uh, Karim, I wanted to ask, since Queen Elizabeth is or was Britain's longest uh, serving monarch, mm -hmm. uh, a constant presence in the lives of all Britons and uh, all, the, all the people around the world. I would like to ask Mrs. Uh, Yvonne Ridley, how could you give or could you give us a historical um, significance of this event, of the passing of the Queen? Her whole life was steeped in history, and of course she never expected to become queen. Um, she was the daughter of um, a prince whose brother was king, and uh, his uh, future seemed assured until he married an American divorcee and gave up his throne to, to marry this woman which then propelled his brother, the Queen's father, 
um, into uh, kingship. And it was only at the age of 10 that she realized that she would end up, um, her destiny was as, as queen. So it was, uh, it was something that was, you know, thrust on her um, at quite an early age. Um, mm. But the o opening of your show showed the, um, the gun salutes, which mm. were being fired um, at one o'clock in Britain. And uh, these gun salutes were from various locations around the country to, to mark her death with a round being fired every 10 seconds, representing 96 um, years of her life. So I would imagine that uh, the, the guns will still be sounding long into this, uh, this program. Uh, she was the world's longest serving monarch, not only uh, Britain's, and um, as such, Charles III, the former heir to the throne um, was the longest serving heir to the throne and he is now the oldest uh, person to become king mm -hmm. um, in the history of uh, Britain. So there are lots of historical records um, that are being broken with the ending of the Elizabethan era and mm -hmm. the arrival of the reign of King Charles. Mm -hmm. um, very nice know, indeed. Very uh, historic times. Mm -hmm. Very nice indeed. Uh, uh, it seems that uh, Donald Lowry is back with us. And uh, Mr. Donald uh, Lowry, you can resume your answer as we were having uh, some technical problems. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, I just wanted to add there that, uh, of course, those gun salutes continue across the world because the the Queen was uh, Queen not only of Britain, of the United Kingdom, but also of 15 other fully independent countries, but separately. And so mm -hmm. this morning, for example, uh, in Canberra, there were also uh, gun salutes and across to Ottawa and Vancouver and other parts, Auckland, Wellington other parts of the Commonwealth. And of course, because this curious situation of the Queen uh, uh, being simultaneously Queen of these other countries. And of course, uh, King Charles III inherited the monarchy at the moment that she died. So with her last mm. breath, uh, all the other things that are happening now, the Privy Council meeting and eventually the coronation, these are just public manifestations of it. But the actual moment of the succession was the moment of the Queen's death uh, and it's at that moment that the king succeeded, not just in the United Kingdom, but as I say, in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Jamaica, and a dozen other countries. So mm -hmm. it's quite a, a sim symbolic moment uh, for her, uh, the other, the, uh, for, the, 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 for the country and for the Commonwealth. Uh, the other point I think that has just been raised is that, uh, is that um, of course, it's, such a, it's, it's been such a, a reign of changes. Uh, you know, she, she uh, inherited the monarchy at a time uh, when Britain was still an imperial power, and mm -hmm. she oversaw the decolonization of large parts of it in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, and uh, this, uh, and of course, enormous changes within Britain itself, culturally and also morally and religiously. Uh, uh, at that time, for example, a few years after her coronation, her sister uh, gave up uh, her um, desire to marry uh, a divorce group captain, because at that time the monarch could not be even seen together uh, in uh, royal gatherings with divorced people. And now, of course, her own children have been divorced. So mm -hmm. the, the changes in the country's religious composition, although, of course, it's still uh, she uh, she was head of the or was governor of the Church of England, uh, sort of uh, an honorary position, really. Uh, and of course, King Charles is uh, succeeding to that position. So it, it, she managed to maintain a stability through a time of enormous change. And this, of course, uh, uh, is something that has marked out the, uh, her reign, particularly. Mm -hmm. and so, so, yes, go ahead, uh, Marisa Khmer. Sir, uh, Donald Laurie, you say that uh, Queen Elizabeth was a witness of a change in um, history. The most recent survey uh, put 60% for keeping the monarchy, uh, while 27% against it, and the rest undecided. You know, most of the people have a positive uh, reaction to uh, the Queen Elizabeth II. 
we uh, see a real sense of uh, someone who represented something really special, really positive about being the queen, uh, the monarchy and uh, Britain. Over this period of 70 years as monarch, there were numerous changes, as you said, uh, in the United Kingdom uh, on many levels. We're talking about person uh, or personally speaking uh, with the family uh, in national matters or even international matters. So many things happened. What would you pick on as perhaps the most or the moment that has marked these uh, 70 years of her reign? Well, for me personally, I think, uh, although there are many such moments, but just uh, um, uh, immediately, the, the moment for me was uh, when she visited Ireland in 2011. Mm -hmm. uh, this was the first visit to Ireland by a, a British monarch since, uh, in, in a century, since 1911. And of course, uh, you know, she came at a time when uh, the peace process in Northern Ireland was underway. Uh, she also had her own direct connections in the in, and tragic ones in the sense that her own cousin, Lord Mountbatten of, um, of Burma, had been murdered by the IRA in 1979. And uh, this touched her deeply, of course, and touched the family deeply. Uh, and yet she still met uh, people from the same political party, uh, at least the political wing of the, of the group that, that murdered her cousin. Uh, and was able to do this uh, and uh, and made a, also uh, in a visit to Dublin was able to give a speech which charmed everyone. She even managed to mm -hmm. speak in Irish. So I think uh, I say there are many moments uh, that uh, could be pointed up. That was a ma major one. Also in uh, in in the in the role uh, in bringing about the end of uh, racial segregation in Southern Africa in what was Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, and in um, in uh, South Africa as well. Uh, where she started out, of course, uh, making that vow in 1947, and uh, she went back in 1994 and uh, uh, on a very uh, welcome visit by um, uh, President Mandela. So she managed to, to see through these things, and I think uh, a monarch was able to, uh, who was able to speak for the nation in a way that I think an elected president cannot quite deliver in the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure there have been major presidents, of course, and in the case of Algeria, we'll remember, of course, the President de Gaulle of France. But even in the case of France, uh, President de Gaulle didn't quite achieve uh, uh, that transcendent uh, ability to speak for a, a very wide section of society. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I think that's that's a very a major part of it. Um, uh, that sense of duty, I think that is the strongest thing that she had. She, mm -hmm. she, and the denial of the self. We live at, at the moment, I think, in many ways, in a very narcissistic age, and people concentrate on the self and on, on and whereas she uh, did not uh, um, concentrate on herself, but on her duty. And I think she took that very seriously. And I think she was a very religious woman. Of course, we know this about her. And I think she took that religious vow she made mm -hmm. as a young girl, scarcely a woman, uh, very seriously. Speaking of the religious uh, vow, uh, Mrs. Yvonne, do you think that uh, King Charles III will actually be as committed as his mother was? I would think so, simply because he has been um, an heir in waiting for such a long time, and the rule of his mother could, you know, could not have failed to influence him in some way. Um, he is very much his own person, uh, but I do think that uh, he will uh, take faith matters very seriously. Um, mm -hmm. Queen Elizabeth was the defender of the faith, mm -hmm. and Charles has made it known that uh, he would like to be known as defender of faiths. Because, of course, uh, Britain is no longer a, a, just a Christian country. Um, its citizens represent, um, a, you know, many diverse beliefs and cultures. And this is something that he has said in the past. Mm -hmm. He's also been quite ex um, outspoken um, on matters to do with climate and mm -hmm. environment. So I think that although he will uh, follow in the path of his mother, I think... But it seems like, according to a lot of uh, analysts, say that uh, he has really a, a bigger shoes to fill, don't you think? 
Well, it, it, he he does have a, a huge task ahead of him. Hmm. And, of, of course, these are also perilous times, I believe, for the monarchy, because despite um, polls saying that the majority of people uh, would prefer the monarchy remain, hmm. I suspect that if those polls were conducted in Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland and Scotland, the result might be quite different because these are two countries that are looking um, to change their status. Uh, there's quite a move in Scotland um, for another independence referendum and next October has been earmarked. And in Ireland, there is uh, increasing talk of a united Ireland, but our other guest might mm -hmm. be able to enlighten us more on that. So Charles, uh, the third will have challenges that uh, his mother didn't. As I say, we've seen the end of the Elizabethan era, and this will the next few weeks will be a time of reflection where people will be questioning, you know, do we need a monarchy in the 21st century? Um. Speaking of, uh, Karim, since we're talking about King Charles, mm -hmm. I would like to come back to the history uh, with Dr. Laurie. You, you know, we have seen that the popularity of the King of uh, King Charles has fell after Prince Diana's, uh, or Princess Diana's uh, death. Do you think he has recovered uh, from that event? And do you think Britain has moved on uh, from this? Well, I think, uh, to a great extent, I think it has. There's a general acceptance that uh, that now is uh, over 20 years ago. Uh, there are those who still take a very strong uh, view against um, the Queen, uh, the new Queen, uh, Queen Camilla, who was the Queen Consort, mm -hmm. because of that. And uh, this also affected, incidentally, the monarchy in Australia, where there was a lot of uh, disapproval of uh, Camilla and uh, uh, attachment to Diana. I think uh, it was a moment when, when the uh, both uh, uh, King Charles and uh, uh, Diana uh, talked publicly about their private affairs. It was a, a very difficult moment for the monarchy, and of course, her death also. Uh, the monarchy has clearly changed, has been changed as a result of that, and uh, and the public has become more intrusive. It, it, until the 1960s, certainly the monarchy was very guarded by people. You know, newspaper editors would not publish things about the monarchy without consent, and the Lord Chamberlain could censor programs about the monarchy. Uh, whereas uh, in the 70s and 80s, there was an opening out of, of that uh, of the monarchy, and uh, but of course the problem there is a problem about uh, how far you should let light in and mystery as a, 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 a constitutional uh, writer of the 19th century, Walter Badgett said, you know, you shouldn't uh, let light, light in and magic, you know, and in a sense, that's the problem for the monarchy, that balance between being close to the public and yet, and like the public in some respects, of course, he's a man and a, he's a head of a family, just like anyone else or many other people, but at the same time, in some way different and representing some time honored historical continuity. So, and again, as has been pointed out by Yvonne, uh, you know, the, the balancing between accepting uh, Britain as a multicultural society and being a unifying figure for, for, for that new society in a sense, but also representing continuity, uh, like those uh, uh, red-coated um, uh, Beefeater regiment people you can see uh, there on the screen. Uh, somehow it must be both ancient and modern at the same time, and it's, mm -hmm. that's a difficult balancing act. And of course, a lot depends on advice as well, because he can only act on advice. Of course, this is the thing about monarchy. He has to be advised by his ministers to a great extent. He mm -hmm. can't do anything on his own, on his own initiative. Mm -hmm. And the UK Prime Minister Liz Truss on Thursday paid tribute to Queen Elizabeth II for her extraordinary achievement and Britain's longest reigning monarch. Today, the crown passes as it has done for more than a thousand years, to our new monarch, our new head of state, His Majesty, King Charles III. With the King's family, we mourn the loss of his mother. And as we mourn, we must come together as a people to support him, to help him bear the awesome responsibility that he now carries 
for us all. We offer him our loyalty and devotion, just as his mother devoted so much to so many for so long. And with the passing of the second Elizabethan age, we usher in a new era in the magnificent history of our great country, exactly as Her Majesty would have wished, by saying the words, God save the King. And of course, uh, Melissa Noor Khimilat, uh, one might wonder how the monarchy will look like under uh, the reign of Charles. Do you have any questions to address? Exactly, uh, Kareem. Um, mm -hmm. As we have seen, uh, that was uh, the new Prime Minister, the new British Prime Minister. Uh, just two days, the list was paid or uh, paid tribute to the Queen who died yesterday at the age of uh, 96. And there she had the end of the second uh, Elizabeth era and attributed to the new king, King uh, Charles. Charles waited most of his adult life uh, for this moment. Yesterday he expressed his, uh, expressed his greatest uh, sadness for the death of his mother and uh, responsibility, re yeah, and responsibility mm -hmm. already started weighing uh, on his shoulder. I would like to ask uh, Dr. Ridley a question. Do you think that the monarchy is secure under uh, King Charles? Well, we're entering a very strange period because uh, we have a new prime minister, although she represents a government which has been in power for 12 years now. Mm -hmm. um, but she nevertheless is new. We are reaching a crisis in terms of um, uh, the economy, um, a recession looming. These are very troubled times and uh, so it will be interesting to see what impact it has on uh, the reign of Charles III um, and uh, he will be officially proclaimed at the Accession Council um, 10 o'clock tomorrow morning um, in, uh, Saint, in the apartments of St. James's uh, Palace so um, although the moment the Queen died, he became king. Um, the accession um, is official uh, tomorrow. And I think that he will have a lot of challenges that um, will be completely new to the monarchy in Britain today, because these are troubled times. And, of course, the monarchy is uh, not supposed to be a political body. Uh, Queen Elizabeth steered a very uh, narrow path to avoid becoming embroiled in politics, um, both domestically and overseas, which is why she was able to um, to mm. draw in tributes from mm. all around the world, from uh, people of various political stripes, you know, she was mm -hmm. uh, admired because she didn't get involved in politics. However, uh, there have been several occasions where Prince Charles has been caught briefing behind the scenes. Of course, he's now King Charles. Uh, mm -hmm. Will he uh, will he continue this or will he follow his mother's path? That. Mm -hmm remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. And here I invite you, ladies and gentlemen, dear audiences and dear guests, to follow some of the leaders of the Commonwealth uh, countries who have uh, reacted to the news, expressing their condolences on Friday on the passing of Her Majesty the Queen. It is with the deepest of sorrow that we learn today of the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. She was our queen for almost half of Canada's existence. And she had an obvious, deep, and abiding love and affection for Canadians in a complicated world. Her steady grace and resolve brought comfort and strength to us all. Canada is in mourning. She was one of my favorite people in the world, and I will miss her so. With the passing of Queen Elizabeth II, an historic reign and a long life devoted to duty, 
family, faith and service has come to an end. This is a morning of sadness for the world, for the Commonwealth and all Australians. It is a day of profound sadness and grief for the royal family who have lost a beloved mother, grandmother and great-grandmother, the person who for so long was their greatest inner strength. Today marks the end of an era, the close of the second Elizabethan age. This time of mourning will pass, but the deep respect and warm regard in which Australians have always held for Her Majesty will never fade. May she rest in eternal peace. It's with great sadness that New Zealand wakes to the news of the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. I know I speak for all New Zealanders in conveying our deepest sympathy to members of the royal family and condolences to King Charles III on behalf of the government and New Zealanders at this time of enormous loss. The last days of the Queen's life captures who she was in so many ways, working till the very end on behalf of the people she loved. And that is why I'm sure that we will receive the news of her passing with both emotions of deep sadness, but also gratitude for a life that was utterly and completely devoted to the service of others. Now a question to uh, our other guest. Yes, uh, Melissa? Uh, you know, Karim, as I hear or as I listen to all of these statements, I can't, or I can't help but thinking mm -hmm. about or just how much um, that Queen or Queen Elizabeth II matters uh, in the terms of the UK's standing in the world, uh, maybe with Dr. Lowry. Yes, she was uh, you know, so highly respected, uh, not only within the Commonwealth, of course, but also uh, the United States. And uh, I see President Macron of France particularly sent a very gracious um, message today mm. or yesterday mm -hmm. uh, saying just uh, what he, she meant to him. Um, I think the, the, one of the great things about her was that she she kept her, as has already been pointed out, she, 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 she kept her private thoughts to herself. She didn't uh, divide the nation with too strong opinions on things. We, we don't really know all that much about what she thought. Uh, she confided in the, her prime ministers, of course, and she had a right to warn and to advise. But uh, otherwise, she kept above and beyond politics. And I think this, uh, as has, has been already stated, meant that she had a few enemies. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting developments I may, may add to this is that... Uh, even where people expect, for example, in Australia, the weakening of the monarchy, what is interesting is that, uh, according to recent opinion polls, the monarchy is more popular among the very young and indeed people of non-British origin, whereas those who uh, were, if you like, more keener on a republic tend to be uh, what we call the baby boomers, the people born after the Second World War uh, and now an ageing part of the Australian population. So I wouldn't be so... Uh, and even in, the, in relation to Scotland, a lot of uh, Scottish nationalists are not Republicans. They are actually keen on the monarchy. And I noticed how, uh, or certainly divided on the issue, and I noticed how the Scottish First Minister was careful to express uh, her loyalty and uh, uh, sadness at, at, at the Queen's passing. So I wouldn't, uh, in, this, in the case of, North, uh, of Scotland, I wouldn't count out the monarchy or indeed necessarily think that separation is inevitable. A lot may happen between between now and any referendum that might be held. Northern Ireland is a more difficult situation because of demography and changing demography. But even there, you know, there, there, there are a lot of hurdles to get through before Ireland could be reunified. And that might also involve some, mm -hmm. re, you know, some arrangement about the uh, incorporation of the Britishness of, uh, the, of the minority unionist or uh, Protestant population in, on the island. So uh, I think, uh, um, you know, the, the, the monarchy will continue to be relevant even in those uh, situations that we might think uh, it's doomed to uh, recede. I would, mm -hmm. I would be hesitant about that. I would, I would watch that space. Mm -hmm. Very nice indeed. And Mrs. Yvonne, uh, how do you think that the world really perceives uh, Queen Elizabeth? I mean, she has been quite iconic and a lot of people, a lot of leaders actually have great respect to uh, the monarch, the passing monarch. Do you think that uh, uh, Prince uh, Charles or King Charles III will have the same popularity as she did? Well, I wonder how much of uh, this reverence 
is really revolves around the pomp and circumstance that, uh, that is generated uh, by occasions at the royal palaces, you know, for state visits. Um, the Queen was a very charismatic character. Um, was it that that uh, drew leaders or was it the thought of, uh, of going down the mall in the gold carriage, all the history and, and uh, uh, that was attached to it? You know, the, um, we had the ruler of China in the gold carriage uh, and, and, and uh, with the Queen, you know, that was quite an extraordinary um, sight. I think that uh, Charles is is going to have to earn his stripes um, if he is to to get the same respect as mm -hmm. his mother. One thing that um, happened during the uh, Elizabethan uh, era was, you know, she witnessed the evolution of Britain from a declining imperial mm -hmm. power to a multicultural country embracing change. And there were times uh, where on the family front, the Diana, Princess of Wales, catastrophe, all of, all of that really severely uh, dented the monarchy um, through Queen Elizabeth's hard work and endurance and longevity. Um, that was overcame and is now largely mm -hmm. forgotten. Um, but I don't think the House of Windsor can afford any more um, scandals on the domestic front. Mm -hmm. Because Britain is still going through changes. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, while the monarchy... Uh, was revered under the Elizabethan era, mm -hmm. uh, King Charles is certainly going to have to step up to the plate and uh, keep the family together. Absolutely. And just to see how revered he was, here we have more reactions of our world leaders. German President uh, Frank Walter Steinmeier honoured the late Queen, saying millions of Germans today feel a sense of grief and heartfelt sympathy for the people of the United Kingdom. Here in Germany, she was admired and revered. Millions of Germans today feel a sense of grief and heartfelt sympathy for the people of the United Kingdom. Her natural authority, her immense experience, her exemplary devotion to duty will remain in our living memory. Her death is a deep cut, the end of an area. of China also expressed his sincere sympathies to the British government and people in a statement released through state media. The statement said her passing is a great loss to the British people. China deeply mourns the death of Queen Elizabeth II. President Xi Jinping has sent a message of condolence to the new King Charles III. Premier Li Keqiang sent a message of condolence to British Prime Minister Liz Truss. Queen Elizabeth II was in power for 70 years and was committed to promoting national development and increasing friendly exchanges between Britain and other countries in the world. The Queen was the first British monarch to visit China. She has also received many Chinese leaders to visit Britain, making important contributions to enhancing mutual understanding between the Chinese and British people and expanding exchanges between the two countries. And the Ukrainian uh, President Volodymyr Zelensky spoke of his deep sadness at the news, saying the UK and the Commonwealth had suffered an irreparable loss and offered his thoughts and prayers. It is with deep sadness that I learned of the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. This is a heavy loss for Europe and the whole world. On behalf of the Ukrainian people, I express condolences to the royal family, the entire United Kingdom and the countries of the Commonwealth. Our thoughts and prayers are with you. And it seems that the outline arrived 
So here, maybe we can uh, hark back to Elizabeth, when there uh, was a, a queen at only 28 years old, making her youngest monarch in the United Kingdom's history, and uh, met her first minister uh, when she was a princess in 1950. Churchill was a servant admirer of the Queen's father and thought that Elizabeth was too inexperienced at the beginning for the role, but they would become very fond of each other in the future. Now, as we can see, the protocol here, uh, we have uh, King Charles III descending from the aeroplane, getting into a car. So uh, what can you tell us, uh, Mrs. Yvonne, about uh, the image that we are watching live together here? Of the arrival of the airplane? Well, um, I think that we're going to see... Uh, Is there a specific protocol that, uh, that we are following here? We're going to see everything starting to move towards London now. London mm. is going to become the focus of um, attention. As I say, tomorrow uh, King Charles is officially um, announced or pronounced um, in a ceremony at 10 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, in Scotland, um, the monarch's body will be uh, mm -hmm. removed from her residence and uh, will be... Um, I think that she... For how, for how long is this protocol going to take? How many days? Uh... Oh, well, um, it, it, I, I think that the funeral could be held mm -hmm. on the 19th of September. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the next two weeks, there is going to be a period of mourning which will be extended mm -hmm. to three weeks for specifically for members of the uh, royal family. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're going to see a lot more of these images. I mean, at the moment, mm -hmm. um, all of the BBC channels have been solely focused on this uh, on mm -hmm. this occasion. You know, there are no other uh, uh, news events um, that are coming onto our screens just yet. But, maybe uh, maybe uh, if we go to Dr. Donna Lowry, um, could you tell us more about... Uh, the protocol between now and her funeral? Well, uh, I think immediately her, uh, the Queen's body will be lying in state in Edinburgh uh, at St Giles Cathedral uh, on, uh, in the centre of Edinburgh for uh, a period of time. And then to, I think tomorrow the, the body will be uh, flown down to London and then the this, the, the, this sort of week, uh, more than a week of ceremonies will begin. Uh, eventually, uh, her body will be brought to Westminster Hall, which is the oldest part of the House of Parliament. Mm -hmm. It dates back several hundred years, and uh, it's where uh, monarchs and great statesmen have lain in state. And there she will be uh, will lie in state, and, and uh, people will come, and no doubt in their tens of thousands, uh, mm. to uh, file past the, the body. Uh, as, as, as already has been pointed out, the, uh, the, the king will be proclaimed tomorrow at St. James's Palace after a meeting of the Privy Council, which uh, mm. uh, will also, there'll be an announcement uh, from the balcony, I think, uh, with trumpeters uh, announcing that, uh, I think the wording is something like that uh, it has pleased Almighty God to call uh, mm. unto his presence uh, her high and mighty Mm -hmm. uh, um, sovereign Elizabeth II, and then, of course, announcing uh, the um, uh, the succession of King Charles, and then then uh, the the proclamation is made again in the centre uh, of London, in, in, near Trafalgar Square, where there's a statue of King Charles I, who was, of course, uh, uh, put to death uh, under uh, Oliver Cromwell when Britain was briefly a republic in the 17th century. Uh, but it's really because it's the centre of London. So that mm -hmm. proclamation will be also made publicly. And of course, then also across the, the Commonwealth, in, in those parts of the Commonwealth that are still monarchies, that is, mm -hmm. uh, the, Queen, uh, the, the new king will be proclaimed in, in Ottawa, uh, in Canberra. Uh, Wellington and so and so and forth. Mr. Donald uh, Lowry, how are we expecting uh, the speech of King Charles uh, the Third to be like? Oh, it, that will take place this evening. As far as uh, mm -hmm. there'll be, a, a, he will address the nation this evening, uh, and I suspect he will, uh, you know, offer words of uh, obviously, obviously um, 
his sense of loss, but also of of, uh, of reassurance to uh, his subjects. I think uh, that will be his role. Again, to, to emphasize stability. And as has already been pointed out, it's a very troubled time for this country, indeed much of Europe, because of energy crisis. And so uh, it's uh, probably um, uh, particularly important at the moment that the monarchy, which is at the heart of the nation, should represent that stability. Mm -hmm. um, Very nice. Uh, uh, and, and then, of course, uh, the, 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 these days of, 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 of uh, mourning will, will culminate, uh, at least the initial part, in the uh, state funeral from Westminster Abbey. And then the body will be taken from Westminster Abbey after a religious service uh, to Windsor, where she will lie uh, next to, uh, ultimately, uh, next to um, her, near her father and also uh, near um, her husband, the uh, late Prince Philip, uh, who uh, died um, so so maybe, recently. Maybe for more insights now about the Queen's life, uh, we shall follow this portrait that Nabil Khazini compiled for us. The crowning achievement of Britain's Queen Elizabeth was to maintain the popularity of the monarchy across decades of seismic political, social and cultural change that threatened to make it an anachronism. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. Elizabeth helped steer the institution into a modern world, stripping away court ritual and making it somewhat more open and accessible, all in the glare of an increasingly intrusive and often hostile media. While the nation she reigned over sometimes struggled to find its place in a new world order, and her own family often fell foul of public expectations. The queen herself remained a symbol of stability. She also tried to transcend class barriers and earned the grudging respect of even hardened Republicans. To much of the world, she was the personification of Britain, yet she remained something as an enigma, as an individual, never giving an interview and rarely expressing emotion or offering a personal opinion in public. A woman recognized by millions, but known by hardly anyone. At first, Elizabeth relied heavily on her father's old circle of advisors, but gradually she brought in some more career diplomats and business executives to the royal court, as she and her husband Philip sought to modernize the monarchy. In the last 20 years, backed by a far more professional and sophisticated media operation, there was still pomp and pageantry, but less formality around the queen and her family. Her working life included thousands of official engagements, varying from trips to schools and hospitals to the grand ceremonies of state visits and national occasions. She was famous for wearing brightly colored outfits with a matching hat on royal engagements to ensure she stood out from the crowds on her many walkabouts. She traveled further than any previous monarch, overtaking more than 250 overseas visits to well over 100 countries. She was renowned for her stamina and began cutting back on a once hectic timetable of foreign tours only as she moved into her 80s. Even in her 90s, she regularly carried out engagements. On one such event at the age of 93, she told officials she was still capable of planting a tree before shoveling the soil into a hole. And it was another two years after that before she needed to use a walking stick in public. So back to you, Mrs. Yvonne Lydry. Queen Elizabeth II, one of the longest ruling monarchs in the whole world, left us at the age of 96, but leaving behind her history full of political, social, and cultural change in the British monarchy that helped steer the institution into the modern world. What more can you tell us about that particular point? Well, I think that the Elizabethan era will be reflected upon very kindly by historians. And as I say, we are now entering a, a totally troubled time with um, a recession looming, energy uh, costs and prices uh, causing great alarm, a war in, in Europe, um, in Ukraine. Uh, these are incredibly troubled times, very challenging times, and uh, Britain is, um, you know, has a new prime minister. It now has a new monarch. So uh, both of them are going to be scrutinized very closely over the next few weeks and months 
to see how they perform. And I think that uh, Prince Charles in particular will find it extremely challenging um, because he will be expected not to comment publicly. You know, his mother never gave, as far as I'm aware, a single media interview. She never sat down uh, with journalists and gave them briefings or private briefings, which Prince, uh, well, King, King Charles has been uh, known to do in, in the past. So will he follow his mother closely in as much as he will ditch all um, hands-on uh, initiations mm -hmm. with the media? Or, or will he enter into a new style of um, royalty? in his dealings with the media. It, it is going to be very interesting to watch. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he's, he's got quite a, a tough job ahead of him. Um, you know, the, the uh, Queen was thrust into uh, power at a very unexpected uh, time in her life, uh, whereas uh, King Charles has been waiting in the sidelines longer than any other heir to the throne and he is the oldest new king of mm -hmm. England. Very nice indeed. And in her reigning era, UK Queen Elizabeth held diverse visits to the Middle East within uh, different programs. What can you tell us about uh, these visits and how significant and their importance, uh, Mr. O'Donnell? Well, of course, Britain uh, retains, uh, well, throughout her reign, retains strong links to the Middle East, uh, particularly uh, mm -hmm. in the Gulf. And uh, Yes, uh, about the visit in the Middle East in particular, because uh, UK did have a great importance, actually, in the shaping of the Middle East. And perhaps well, uh, the relationship of the people there, maybe with the monarchy, is not uh, really as, uh, uh, let's say, warm as uh, one would expect. But still, a lot of people held this... Uh, admiration and, and affection toward the Queen. Yes, I, I, well, as far as as I'm aware, it seems that people distinguish between actions of British governments in the past. Indeed, France, we, we know, of course, Britain and France divided the Middle East after the First mm -hmm. World War, and these have had enormous results, uh, um, implications for today, and, and, of course, also in the case of Israel and the Balfour Declaration and so forth. But I think people do often distinguish between uh, actions of past governments and the monarch. Mm -hmm. Also, of course, those parts of the, uh, especially of the Gulf states that are themselves monarchs, uh, there is, of course, a close relationship between uh, the, the uh, there has been between the monarchy and and the uh, rulers of the Gulf states. And I might add here that one of the conventions that survives mm -hmm. uh, into the present time is that uh, the monarch, uh, British monarchs, address uh, the monarchs of other countries as either my good brother or my sister. Uh, it's a very well, a quaint convention. It doesn't apply to other heads of state, uh, mm -hmm. presidents, but it does apply to monarchs. So uh, the Queen will have addressed uh, the King of Saudi Arabia as my brother, my good brother, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, signed off on that. Now, these sort of these things, and of course, uh, other royal gatherings, even in Europe. Uh, of course, the Queen is related to so many royal families that, are, that remain across Europe. Uh, these, uh, of course, invite other rulers from the Middle East as well. So you, it, it, monarchy, in a sense, is one of those archetypes that transcends nationality and race in a way that um, uh, other forms of nationalism don't. Uh, it, it, monarchy, it, it, in a way, monarchy also dilutes nationalism because it is so transcendent, whereas countries that don't have monarchies sometimes stray into uh, extreme nationalism. We only have to look at interwar Germany. One of the reasons why uh, uh, Adolf Hitler gained power was because the monarchy had been uh, abolished or had, uh, had Dr. gone. Dr. Laurie, Maybe as a final question, do you think that this relationship will change now that the Queen is dead? Uh, with the Middle East? Or, yes, or with the Middle East. More generally. Uh, I don't. I don't think so, because again, Charles himself has uh, long had a strong, um, uh, you know, uh, he uh, has advocated uh, respect for Islam, for example. He was very supportive of the Centre for Islamic Studies at, in Oxford, and uh, he is a very tolerant man, and he's very interested in religions generally, and in, in protecting religions. So I think that will 
be a continuing bond between him and and uh, uh, these states, of course. There's also a strategic relationship, of course, which will also be there. I mean, uh, Very and interesting military indeed, security Mr. relationships. Uh, Donald uh, Rowley and uh, Mrs. Uh, Yvonne Ridley, thank you so much for these thorough analysis and joining us in this special coverage. Of course, the special coverage continues right after the news bulletin that's coming right after. Thank you so much, dear viewers. That's the end for now.